Before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience that our organization, Torch, is still giving away free Shabbat light switch covers, free mitzvah magnets. Everyone who received them loves it. Go get one for yourself for free. We'll ship it to you for free. You could find the link to order it on the description of this podcast. You could simply visit our website, torchweb.org, and we'd be delighted to ship you some mitzvah magnets, some Shabbat light switch covers. This week's Parsha is Parsha's Kiseitze. It's a Parsha that has tons of mitzvos. And I was thinking to remind the audience that I am also the host of the Mitzvah podcast. That is a podcast that tries to go through 613 mitzvos and give a little bit of an overview, a little bit of a snapshot of each mitzvah and what better week to remember about the mitzvah podcast than Parsha's Tisaytse, the Parsha that has more mitzvahs than any Parsha in the Torah. I had a conversation with a highly skilled consultant and a dedicated listener to the Parsha podcast, and he told me that he never heard of the mitzvah podcast. So he advised me to always try to cross-pollinate in all my podcast channels, and thank God I have six of them, I should always reference at least one of my other channels each time I record an episode. So maybe this is a little bit of an inartful way to plug it, pointing out there's lots of mitzvahs in this year's parsha, and then I also host the Mitzvah Podcast, but I think it's a good idea. Maybe we'll keep at it. You let me know if I find better ways to seamlessly insert plugs for my other channels. Now, I noticed an interesting pattern, or several interesting patterns, in this week's Parsha. The Parsha starts off with a very unusual mitzvah, and that is the mitzvah of a beautiful and seductive captive. You go to war, and you see this beautiful woman, and there's this very interesting process that is done, and eventually you could marry this Gentile woman, this beautiful captive that you encountered in war. So the Parsha begins with the war. And all the way at the end of the parsha, the parsha ends also with a war. It ends with a war that the Jewish people must engage with the nation of Amalek. The foe of our people, the anti-Jewish nation is Amalek. And we're told that we have to always remember this war, never give up this war. We have to erase the name of Amalek from underneath the heavens. So the parsha starts off with a war. It ends off with a war. And quite interestingly, our sages tell us that both of these wars, of course, they're actual physical encounters with a physical human enemy, but they allude to spiritual wars as well. Our sages tell us that the partial begins when you go out to the war against the enemy, and it doesn't actually in Hebrew it doesn't say you go out to a war, you go out to the war with the enemy, and that's a reference to the war against the Yetzer Hara. The war of our lifetime is the war that we have to engage with our internal enemy, our internal nemesis, the Yetzer the evil inclination. And what's being hinted over here, say, so just tell us in this first description of the war where you encounter this this beautiful captive, that's actually hinting at a spiritual war that we all must engage with our internal enemy, with the Yetzirah. Fast forward to the end of the Parsha, the last war, the war against Amalek. Our sages tell us again that Amalek is also an allusion to the Yetzirah as well. In fact, the Zohar says quite clearly that Amalek is a reference to the Yitzrabisha, the Yetzara, the evil inclination. So our Parsha is bookended with hints to wars against the Yetzara. But if we examine them closely, they appear to be quite different encounters, different wars. What happens in the first war against the Yetzara? Apparently, it's a total failure. What happens? You're a righteous Jew, you go to war, and you see this beautiful Gentile captive. And you are so taken by her, you are so stricken by her, and you end up marrying this foreign lady, this Gentile seductive captive. 
you apparently lose the war with the Yetz Sahara. In fact, Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud in the book of Kiddushin, the Torah only speaks against the Yetz Sahara, and here in this mitzvah, the Almighty recognizes, so to speak, that if he does not permit you to marry this Gentile seductive captive, you're going to marry her anyhow. This is a war that you will not win. And therefore, the Almighty permitted it. There's an incredible idea here at the very beginning of our parsha. Amid the passions of war, amid the raw tenacity of battle, and there's this beautiful seductive woman, and she's availing herself to the warriors. Talmud tells us, in this situation, self-control is impossible. There's no way for someone in that condition, in that situation, to be able to overcome the desire and say, you know what, I'm not looking at that woman, I don't want to partake in it, I'm, I'm ignoring it. And therefore, something, the Talmud tells us, something that ought to be prohibited under any other normal circumstances you go to war and you meet this Gentile woman and she's she's dressed seductively and immodestly. This is not a good idea for a nice Jewish boy, you would think. In every other circumstance, says the Talmud, such a situation would be prohibited. However, because this is something that there's no way for you to overcome it, you're going to violate it regardless of what the Torah says, the Torah permits it. This war with the Eight Sahara is unwinnable. And therefore, the Torah is carving out this dubious, if you will, loophole to say, okay, well, there is a process where you could actually marry this beautiful captive. Now, there is a heartening aside over here from this Talmud. It's quoted by Rashi in the second Rashi, second verse of our Parsha. Here, you can't Control yourself. And therefore the Torah says, okay, I'll find a kosher way for you to marry her. But every other time you can control yourself. And the Almighty only gives us challenges that we can withstand and we can't overcome. I think it's quite comforting to know that here and here alone, this war with the Yetzirah is unwinnable. And therefore the Torah teaches us, okay, you're going to lose it. But here's how to lose it properly. But every other challenge is indeed winnable if we put in the right effort. So we have the first war of our Parsha, a war that we cannot win against the Yetzirah. And we fast forward to the end of the Parsha, and we have a war that not only we can win, we must win, and we always have to keep our eye on this ball. We always have to remember to destroy Amalek. It's quite feasible, apparently, at the end of the Parsha. So it's an interesting pattern. Parsha starts off with war. It ends off with war. Both of them, our sages tell us, are hinting at the war against the Yetzirah, against the evil inclination, against the foreign god within, as it's described in the Talmud. And the first war, the one against this captive, so to speak, guaranteed to end in defeat. And the last one, that must end in victory. That's an interesting pattern that maybe there's something to explore. There's a second pattern in this Parsha that is somewhat unusual, and that is an interesting motif that appears five times in our Parsha. There's five mitzvahs in our Parsha, of the many mitzvahs of our Parsha, that describe someone doing a sin, a capital sin, a capital crime, and the Torah says, okay, you have to execute them. And then it says, and you should eradicate and expunge the evil from your midst. So there's five times that it says that this person, this criminal, is such a terrible person, when you kill them, you're actually eradicating, expunging evil from your midst. It talks about the Ben Sormor, the wayward and rebellious son, in chapter 21. In chapter 22, three times with respect to different kinds of adultery. In chapter 24, about kidnapping. These are all capital crimes. And when you execute the offender... When you get rid of this criminal, you are actually eradicating evil from the world. Now, I want to point out that this particular motif is not limited to our Parsha. It actually is featured elsewhere in Deuteronomy and Devarim. The false prophet, for example, chapter 13. Idolatry, chapter 17. 
false witnesses, chapter 19, but it is found in our Parsha more than any other one. Now, there's many mitzvahs in the Torah that carry with it the weight of capital crime, and this description of when you execute the offender, you're getting rid of the evil from your midst, it's actually used specifically for certain punishments and not for others. So all the commentators are trying to figure out why specifically this list of offenders that are executed, why when you execute these people in particular, you are eradicating evil from your midst. Those are the commentators give various answers. Some suggest that these particular sins, they permeate the entire nation. They actually infect the community like a, like a contagion. Uh, others suggest that it's like a, a gangrenous limb, that if you have one part of the body that could potentially imperil the whole body, you gotta cut it off. Uh, it's like a, like a cancerous tumor that you have to remove something from your midst or else it'll affect everything else. But I saw a very interesting Arachim, one of the great commentators in the Torah. He says, You should eradicate the ra, the evil from your midst. That's hinting at the yetzer hara, the evil inclination. When the Torah has all these mitzvahs describing people that commit grave capital offenses, and then you execute them, and you're removing, you're excising the evil from your midst, that is hinting at the war with the yetzer hara. You're supposed to excise the Yetzahara from your midst, the evil nation that you have within you. You're supposed to do like the Torah described by these capital offenders. You're supposed to cut it out and remove this evil from your own midst. Accordingly, we have many hints at the war with the Yetzahara in our Parsha. It starts off with the war with the Yetzahara. It's unsuccessful. It hands off with the war with the Yetzahara, and that must be successful. And then five times in the middle, you have a series of episodes of excising the evil, the evil inclination, from your midst, from amid you. A second interesting pattern that is noteworthy. And a third interesting pattern, this was pointed out to me by my brother, Lashmoli Botnik. Three times in our Parsha, we hearken back to the exodus from Egypt in a very specific way. In chapter 23, verse 4 and 5, it talks about a Ammoni and Moavi, an Ammonite and a Moabite convert. These are people who converted to Judaism. They become Jewish. But because of their pedigree, because they come from the nation of Ammon and Moab, they can never intermarry amongst the regular Jewish people. Why? So the verse explains, because when you left Egypt, when you were on the way, at the exodus from Egypt, they didn't approach you with bread and water. They're not kind people. They're not hospitable people. And therefore, there's something about them that's really corrupt. And we don't want that mixing in with the main body of the Jewish people. But this description, Baderech Mimitzrayim, on the way when you were leaving Egypt. It's a very unique formulation. And it appears not only once in our Parsha, not twice in our Parsha. It appears three times in our Parsha. So the first, like we said, is chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. Ammoni and Moavi converts cannot intermarry amongst the Jewish people because of what they did. Baderech, Betzeschem, Mimitzram, on the way when you left Egypt. And then you fast forward to chapter 24, verse 9. It's talking about Miriam, Moshe's sister, who spoke Lashon Hara, evil talk against her younger brother, and she was stricken with Saras. And the verse tells us, we should remember what God did to Miriam, baderech b'tseschem, maybe it's on the way when you left Egypt. The exact precise formulation appears again in chapter 24, verse 9, with respect to Miriam. And finally, at the end of the parasha, we are urged, this is chapter 25, verse 17, remember what Amalek, the nation that attacked you right upon the Exodus, what they did to you, Baderech Bitseschem on the way when you left Egypt. So I think there's another interesting pattern. We have three verses in our parsha, and I don't believe that this precise formulation appears anywhere else in the Torah. Baderech Bitseschem on the way when you're leaving Egypt, and I think we ought to ponder what the connection is. Now it is maybe interesting. The war with Amalek indeed happened right after the Exodus. 
It's more reasonable to say, hey, when you left the Exodus a couple of weeks later, Amalek attacked. Miriam's Tsaras, when she spoke the evil talk against her brother, that happened more than a year after the Exodus. Yet, it's still describing it, on the way, when we left Egypt, as if it happened immediately after we left. Now, our interactions with the nations of Ammon and Moab, that happened nearly 40 years after the Exodus. And somehow, it's still being described as something that happened on the way, when we left Egypt, as if it was immediately after the Exodus. What is going on with this formulation? So maybe we could speculate. The Yetzirah, evil inclination, is also called, in Jewish literature, as mentioned earlier, the foreign god. And when we're trying to coronate, so to speak, the almighty god as our king, we have to unseat, we have to dethrone the foreign god. The question of where a person stands spiritually is the question of who is their master, who is their deity. Is it the almighty god creator of heaven and earth? Or is it the foreign god, the foe god, the imposter god, who is squatting in their heart? That's what the Yitzhara is. It's the internal foreign god. Who was the first foreign god of our nation? Of course, that was Pharaoh, Pharaoh in Egypt. When we talk about the exodus from Egypt, that too perhaps is alluding to our own personal exodus from our foreign god, so to speak, from the eight Sahara in our midst. So maybe these three verses that talk about with the Exodus are also hinting about that war that we have with our eight Sahara. So we have three unusual patterns. We have the war with the eight Sahara at the beginning of the Parsha, in the episode of the seductive captive, and that one we lose. And at the end of the Parsha, we have the war with the eight Sahara of Amalek, and that one we win. And then five times in the middle of the Parsha, we talk about expunging the evil, hinting at the evil inclination, the Yetzirah from our midst, and three events that happened when we left Egypt, which is another reference to a person freeing themselves from the bondage of the foreign god, not Pharaoh, but the Yetzirah. I want to suggest that this Parsha is laying out for us a complete roadmap to wrestling with and ultimately defeating the Yetzara, the evil inclination, the foreign god from our midst. The Yetzara in Jewish literature is often described in military terms. There's a war with the Yetzara. And we discover that our adversary is highly skilled is armed and dangerous. And unless we devise a comprehensive strategy, our enemy will triumph. What does a winning battle plan look like? Perhaps our Parsha and these patterns that we discover in the Parsha are actually presenting to us a complete, comprehensive approach towards wrestling with and ultimately defeating the Yetzirah. How does it start? It starts off with what is called in military terms, strategic retreat. In a war, of course, there's lots of battles, lots of skirmishes. And some of those battles and some of those skirmishes are going to be losses. But not all losses are created equal. There's a proper way to lose a battle in war the Torah tells us over here, there's a proper way to lose the battle with the Yetzahara. You have a unique situation. People at war. It's a description of hell. And the passions are flaring up. People are dying everywhere. And you see this beautiful captive. And you are pulsating with testosterone. This situation... Or say, just tell us, the Torah tells us, there's no way to win this war, this battle, against the Yetzhara. And what is appropriate in this instance is to lose this war, but to not get wiped out. 
to prevent a total devastation, to lose with minimal casualties. Even when we sin, and we have to sin apparently, let's do it in the way prescribed by the Torah. Let's try to delay. There's this whole process of delaying the relationship with this Gentile captive. You're fighting the Eitzhara. You may lose, but you're going to go down swinging. You're not going to give up without a good fight. There's a huge difference between a loss, a sin, done after some struggle versus a sin when the Yetzirahara, the evil inclination, the foreign god, is in total command. When there's a sin, there's always a risk of a free fall. There's always a risk that now the floodgates are going to open and one sin will beget a second sin, which will beget a third sin. Before you know it, the person is spiritually lost. Here we're told, when you fall, stabilize yourself. Don't lose everything. Don't fall into a free fall and be totally lost. I think this is maybe a heartening aside number two. We have the Almighty's Torah. And sometimes we feel like imposters. What connection do I have to the Almighty's Torah? And here we see something really interesting. The Torah is providing us guidance no matter where we are holding. This episode, it's a testament that with the Torah, we are never guideless. Here the Torah is telling us, in effect, how to sin. It's a wild insight. You're going to sin. There's no way to win this particular battle with the eight Sahara. But stabilize yourself. Avoid the free fall. Sin, so to speak, in a way, it's a kosher way. Try to delay it. Try to let the lust dissipate. Sin with a sigh. Feel bad about it. Sin with a little bit of guilt. Even when the sin is inevitable, the beginning of our parsha tells us how to do it. And depending upon how someone sins, that is going to determine how the rest of this engagement with the Yetzirah looks like. So if someone who's a fighter, yes, they're sinning, but they're still a fighter. That is the first step that is needed on the path of total conquest of the Yetzirah. What happens next to the Parsha? We're told five times eradicate evil from your midst. There's five people, sinners, capital crime offenders, that when you get rid of them, you are removing, eradicating a little bit of evil from your midst. And again, our Satanists tell us that that is also hinting at how we're supposed to engage with the Yitzhahara. This is an incredible instruction. Don't try to solve your life's biggest problem in one day. You have Yetzirah. It's a foreign God. It's squatting within you. It has usurped God, the real God, from being your master. How do you remove it? How do you excise it from within you? How do you scrape yourself clean of the nefarious influence of the Yetzirah? Here we're told, do it bit by bit. Fight piecemeal. Identify the areas where the Yetzirah is in control and fight with guerrilla warfare. Stamp out this influence of the Yetzirah, eradicate that, excise bit by bit, chop a little bit off over here, a little bit over there, pile up those victories, and eventually you'll have momentum. This war is a lifetime's work. It does not, and it should not, be attempted all at once. Only if we are clever and industrious will we be able to combat such a fierce and wily enemy. Eradicate this evil from your midst. Eradicate that evil from your midst. Piece by piece, you can systematically dismantle the infrastructure of the foreign god from within. And finally, we are told three times that there are things that happen on the way when you left Egypt. Baderech b'tzeichem mitzrayim. Our personal exodus, our personal liberation from the bondage of the Eitzar, of the foreign God within us, will not be complete unless we avoid the pitfalls along the way. It starts off with Ammon and Moab. Of course, that's an historical event that happened. But here, 
on this homiletical level, it's describing the perils of what happens when we leave Egypt. We have a nation of Ammon and Moab, and there are bedraggled travelers, and they don't greet them with food and water. Us, in our fight against the Eight Sahara, we can be so consumed with our own personal growth, with our own relationship with God, with trying to get rid of the foreign God from within us, that we can begin to ignore our fellow man. And that's a huge mistake. The Torah is trying to teach us, to train us, to complete personal transformation, to become a great person. And that cannot be done if we ignore the people. Hospitality, looking out for the betterment of others, thinking about the physical needs of other people, food, water, those things, that's the danger or one of the dangers of what happens when someone's leaving Egypt. You'd be leaving Egypt, but you're so laser focused on getting rid of the foreign god, of escaping Pharaoh, of getting rid of the Eight Sahara, that you start to ignore the people. And you start to think, well, the physical needs of other people, that's not so important. And here we're told that's a danger. That's an obstacle that could prevent the exodus from actually happening. Rabbi Israel Salanter, the founder of the Muslim movement, used to say, someone else's physical and material agenda is my spiritual agenda. Someone else's food, someone else's water, someone else's well-being and comfort and hospitality, that is something that I need to do for my spiritual advancement. Don't make that mistake when you leave Egypt, when you conquer the Eight Sahara. Next, we have the episode of Miriam. Miriam spoke Lashon Ra, evil talk against her brother. This, too, is another potential pitfall that could happen with our own personal exodus. Whenever someone advances one step in spiritual growth, in fighting, resisting the Eight Sahara, developing self-control, overcoming their innate whims of the Eight Sahara, overcoming and resisting the commands of the foreign god, there must be a parallel and concomitant step in humility and kindness. Whenever someone grows spiritually, all the time, any growth that happens spiritually, any growth of personal development, always comes with an increase or potential increase of haughtiness, of boastfulness, of looking down at others who are not growing. The first day you're on your diet and you're watching your carb intake and making sure you're having too much sugar, that first day you see someone else binging on Oreos, you start judging them. Yesterday you were the same exact person. But once you change, you say, okay, I'm better than them. And that's the danger. And that is manifested by Lashon Ara. When someone speaks Lashon Ara against their fellow man, they are intimating that I am better. And what happens? If you're going to leave Egypt, but you're going to trample on other people, you're going to lose more than you gain. When you're leaving Egypt, don't be like Miriam. Of course, Miriam was a great person. She was a prophetess. But the idea, don't make that mistake, the mistake of falling into the trap of the Yetzirah. Yetzirah says, okay, I'll let them leave Egypt, but I'll lay a delicious trap for them and let them become a sinner who does Lashon Hara. Don't make that mistake. Don't belittle and view other smaller people with contempt because now you're leaving Egypt and they're still stuck in Egypt. That would be a grave mistake. And finally, we're told that the road to victory is long and hard. Before you could complete this war, before you could ultimately triumph over your enemy, you must square off against the last threat to total victory. Amalek is called the cooler. There's a piping hot bath, and Amalek is suicidal. They're crazy. They're maniacs. They jump into the piping hot bath, but then they cool it down for everyone else. The power of Amalek, one of the powers of Amalek, is to weaken resolve, weaken passion, dampen 
spirits. Someone could be on fire, excited to leave Egypt, excited to triumph over the Eight Sahara. Comes along a Malik and says, well, it's not so hot. It's not so dangerous. It's not so important. In addition, Amalek fosters opacity, uncertainty, doubt. Are you really sure? Is this a good idea? Does it really matter so much? We can be on the doorstep of victory. And we're going to need to batter through the final obstacle to complete our exodus. And only then can we say that our exodus is complete if we remember what Amalek did, don't fall into that trap, then indeed we could erase the memory of Amalek. We could actually completely eradicate the Yitzhak from our midst. So we have a few interesting patterns in our Parsha. And when we string them together, we learn something really powerful. The war against the Sahara, the war of our lifetime, is called many different things in our Parsha. It's the war against the enemy as personified by this beautiful captive. It's described as eradicating the evil from our midst, getting rid of the foreign god from within us. It's our own personal exodus from Egypt. It's this lifelong struggle with Amalek, our nefarious nemesis. And we're speculating that the Torah's guidance in our parsha is showing us a complete and total roadmap to successfully triumphing over the Yitzhara. We start off with an enemy that's much stronger than us. And we're acknowledging we will lose some initial battles. But there's a proper way to lose. And depending upon how we lose, that's going to determine if we will advance in our overall objective. We're going to go down swinging. We're going to put up a fight. We're going to mount the resistance. We're going to lose. But we fought like a warrior beforehand. And we made progress. And then, bit by bit, we're going to eradicate the evil from our midst. We're going to fight the war piecemeal. Chop off a little bit over here. Chop off a little bit over there. And eventually, make serious progress. And along this path of our personal exodus, our personal freedom from bondage of Egypt, we have to avoid the various dangers along the way. Lack of kindness, lack of appreciation, lack of caring for others, making sure that we speak nicely and kindly about other people, not taking things for chance, not having all this murkiness and opacity of Amalek, not losing the fire, and finally, perhaps we will be so fortunate as to be able to claim total victory by eradicating our enemies. We stabilize. Make sure when you sin, you avoid the free fall. We exercise bit by bit. We acknowledge this is a long, arduous, difficult, lifelong battle. Eventually, if we follow this roadmap, we can completely neutralize the enemy. That's the plan. We win. They lose, provided we follow this guide as laid out by our parsha. Now, I would add, this is quite topical to the month that we're in right now, the month preceding Rosh Hashanah, the month that we call Elul. Rosh Hashanah is about coronation of God. Whenever we coronate God, that has to be to the exclusion of the foreign God, to the exclusion of the Yetzirah. So it's quite apropos that we see all these hints at engaging and resisting and combating and eventually getting rid of, triumphing over the eight star of the foreign god. This is a good time and topical time to focus on it because that is one of the major emphases of this month of El and, of course, of Rosh Hashanah. And on that note, I'll give a plug on my other podcast channel, This Jewish Life. This week I released an episode on the essence of El, the essence of the month that precedes Rosh Hashanah. It may be worthwhile for you to give it a listen. Thank you for listening. Have an amazing Shabbos. My email address is rabbiwalbeitjima.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Any questions, any comments, any feedback is always cherished.